Welcome everyone to the Holy Sparks podcast. Saul K here, super excited and grateful for yet another groundbreaking episode. And without further ado, I'm going to do a different type of intro today focused on the book, which we're going to talk about shortly. Ron Cardos and Bruce Licht are the editors of the Amazon best-selling book, Elevator Pitches for God. I'm going to start with a quote from the book. We have observed a groundswell of interest and a real need for a non-religious conversation about God. The world is desperate for meaning, purpose, and wisdom. A glance at social media will show you that the struggle is real. Humans are by nature religious. We have an innate need to worship something. That might be health, politics, beauty, or money, but it might be something deeper and more meaningful. One final quote. Our aspirations in this book are, in a non-religious way, to introduce people to God and strengthen the faith of those who already believe. In doing so, we hope to find common ground, bring people together, provide greater meaning to their lives, and start to transform the world in a positive direction. Gentlemen, welcome to the Holy Sparks podcast. Thank you, Saul, for having, for having us. us. What an honor to be here on your podcast pleasure and this will be the first time i'm interviewing two people at once so we'll go back and forth a little bit and i'd like to introduce both of you men to our audience by talking a little bit about your background in terms of growing up jewish bruce would you like to start sure i grew up in northern california in the east bay and when i was young my i had christmas trees in my house until one of my parents friends said to them you're jewish you really shouldn't do that so I went to a reform synagogue. I was bar mitzvahed, confirmed. I went to Israel. But at the end of that, it's surprising how little I knew about my religion. And I'm not blaming it on my synagogue. I take full responsibility because at the time I was just not a good vessel. I was into girls, sports, as I got older, cars, my wife, my family, my career. And I went to temple, but Whatever was being delivered there just really wasn't being said in a really compelling, inspiring way. So it's amazing that at the end of the day, my knowledge of Judaism really could barely fill the bottom of a thimble. And as I got older and married, we had a family and we celebrated Hanukkah and Passover and all that. But I sure hope that nobody asked me anything more than just the very most surface explanation of what the holidays were, because I really didn't know it. I could say a couple prayers. Most of the times I would say them, I'd say them probably wrong. I could sing the song Bim Bomb without a song sheet, but that was about it. Bruce, Manish Tana. <laughs> okay. Ron? At the end of this program, Bruce is going to sing the Bim Bomb Bomb <laughs> song for us, which we look forward to. <laughs> Okay, that'll be a good outro. Ron, what about you? Both my parents were orphans, and they knew they had no real parenting. And although we knew we strongly identified as Jews, they really didn't have anything. And what I didn't really, I went to Hebrew school like a few times. I hated it. It's a good thing I didn't go because most of my cousins were bar mitzvah, and I have 60 first cousins in Los Angeles. And most of them are not religious at all. Many of them are Christians today. I think it, myself, and I think I'm the only uh, observant Jew in the group. And I never was bar mitzvahed. I'm the guy they asked to leave Los Angeles. They told me I wasn't shallow enough. And then I think I was asked, we weren't really asked, when the when the, it became real political, our local shul here, our reform shul, it just was about politics. I was really looking for it. I was real low-hanging fruit, easy to close. I was the deal that, in any way, when they got, they were just only interested in politics. There was no more tour there. I called up local Chabad, walked in, was very honest and said, I don't know a darn thing. I know what Bruce knows. He's a PhD next to me. Mm -hmm. And they said, oh, no problem. Come in. Here's the reading list. And so I started that upward climb. And I've been, it's now, it's been like six or seven years. And uh, I, Bruce and I, we take classes. I take 16 a week. Um, I love it. It comes naturally to me. I am very like it's in my DNA. I like everything about it and I'm off to the races. So I'm very lucky. So that's kind of my upbringing from a Jewish standpoint. Wow. 16 classes a week. That's a lot. When I, a lot of Jews have this experience. There's this concept that we're born into the world knowing the entire Torah. Right. Angel comes and smacks us on the mouth. We start crying. We forget everything. 
this is the idea that we're all Baal Teshuvah, we're all returning, and that when you're learning Torah, it's like, oh yeah, I know, that. I feel like I knew this already and I'm remembering it, right? Yeah. Does that describe a little bit of what you're, of what you're feeling there? No. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, I wish I did. I have to try and I review it and review it. And read it. I don't know. Bruce, do you feel that way? Do you feel like you've been here before? Or? No. When I started taking classes, I just couldn't believe what I was learning because I just never learned that before. So as opposed to, let me clarify, as opposed yeah. to, oh, I knew this already. Oh, I already knew this Sphero in a past life, and I'm just being reminded. It's more a feeling of coming home as opposed to, oh, yeah, 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 know, yeah. Like yeah. I'm learning like programming code, which is completely foreign to, at least for me anyway, to, to everything that I understand. Whereas this sense of, ah, that's what I'm talking about. Okay. Yeah. And I think every, I think if every Jew out there would stop fighting it and just accept for now that this Judaism has been practiced for 30, 300 years the same up until about 150 years ago there was only one judaism there were no branches it was just everyone had shabbos everyone turned everything off it was all the same you had some levels of various observance but everyone knew with knew what we, we were supposed to do yeah okay but so, so you, have a, you have a soul the size of the outdoors so if anyone would come easy it's you your music is just when you listen to your music it's I, I already know you oh thank you okay it's not about me but back to you gentlemen okay <laughs> Bruce, now I, I think I did notice you wearing a kippah on your head. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So now are you more kind of Shomer Mitzvot these days? Yes, most definitely. I, I'm a Shomer Shabbos and I s start my day off early in the morning with a Torah study and I just can't get enough of it. I love it. I love it. I think if more Jews would simply just learn half an hour, 45 minutes a day, whatever, just pick your way into the buffet, it would be right. incredible, an incredible machai. Okay, just very briefly, let's talk a little bit. I know that you, as far as I know, you're not both full-time book publishers. This isn't your main source of Parnassah. Are there other things that you do in the world that would be interesting for people to learn about? We were both retired and we were both learning. We actually flew to Houston and we started, I don't know, Bruce, if you want to tell the story, but we were just trying to learn. And then we, we heard someone give a kind of an, a Bruce heard someone on a bike trip give like an elevator pitch for what Judaism was. And he and his wife were blown away by how this guy could talk, speak for five minutes eloquently, succinctly. And just, he looked at his wife and said, we can't do that. What do we know? We felt, you know, felt really ignorant. Mm -hmm. So Bruce and I were learning and Bruce is terrific. I, I hope you don't mind Bruce. He has binders. He writes everything down. He's very meticulous. And we, and so he's reviewing, he has his binders and we're trying to put together our own elevator pitch for what is Judaism? If someone says to you, Hey, I don't know anything about Judaism. Tell me about it. What would you say? And you know, is it a religion? Is it a relationship? I think nowadays, I think the thing I hear most is it's not, we're not really religion. It's a relationship. I hear it's, we're a family. We're not a nation, of course, until we rebuild the base of Magdus, the, the Holy Temple. But in any event, so we were working on that. We were getting our pitch down. And then I don't know where it came out of left field. I said, what about proof of God? Because I'm struggling with this. And so we asked one of the world's most downloaded rabbis, Rabbi Yaakov Wolby at torchweb.org. If you haven't downloaded his podcast, he fills Oracle Stadium every week with people who download this, torchweb.org, the Parsha podcast. Anyway, he answered this. He answered a question and Bruce recorded it and it blew us away. Like a proof of God, just like that. And I said, if, if we asked a thousand different people, I bet we get a thousand different answers, but let's try it. Let's send invitations to everyone, all the smartest people in the world. And guess what? To our surprise, we got responses. They said, yes, ambassadors, senators, movie stars, captains of, indus captains of industry. Uh, we can name their names. The guys who ran Intel, the guys who, uh, what's called Guitar Hero, the guy who invented Guitar Hero, sold it to Facebook for $2 billion, whatever. They said yes. And they kept, and the, and, and the responses kept coming in. The essays came in. And they're magnificent. So what we did is we put them all in one. We didn't put them all in one book. We, we chose 70 of the, the ones we thought were best balanced. We put them in a book and uh, we came out with it. We were not. Elevator Pitches for God, 71 page essays by thought leaders on why they believe. Yeah, we published it ourselves, and it's become a bestseller and it's being very well received. And we're, we couldn't be more delighted with our authors. And uh, Bruce is now working on volume two. So we're collecting more essays and uh, that's good. Sort of Okay, are you guys taking submissions or how, or did you re personally reach out to people or can people reach out to you? For we reached out to people. We wanted people from the widest breadth of experiences, backgrounds that we could. We wanted scientists, mathematicians, chemists, 
We have the Supreme Commander of NATO, James Stavridis, Alan Dershowitz. We have heart surgeons, brain surgeons. We just wanted people from the widest range of experiences, and we were hoping that they would bring their life's experiences into their essays. And uh, they did. It was really incredible to read them. Yeah, we have the youngest talk show host, I think, national talk show host in America, Julie Hartman, who has a show called Timeless on YouTube. And she gave a commencement speech at Harvard. And she's what a leader she is. You should check her out her show. And we asked her to write it. She did. And she wrote a great essay. For young people, old people, women. Uh, the women wrote amazing essays. The guys, of course, uh, did a great job too. We asked Muslims. We asked uh, uh, Christians to write. We have many Catholic academics, I would say, from Notre Dame who wrote beautiful essays, engineers. Yeah, it was just, and, and then when the essays came in, they were really something. And it's, it's really, we're, we're so honored that we could do this because we're just two businessmen that are retired. We're not anything special. We didn't have any books. Actually, book ha Bruce had a cookbook before this. I, I stand corrected. He had published a cookbook, a French cookbook, right? He was trained in the French cooking. So it was called, the, the, it's the, called Immediate Chef, No Previous yeah. Experience Required. Immediate yeah. I love it. I think I need to buy that ASAP. Okay, so I have some questions about the book and the formation of the book. So I know that the book on Amazon came out January 2024, right? And so you've been cultivating these interviews and curating it for a while. So what were your plans before the war started for this book? And then I want to talk about how that may have changed or shifted after the war. Bruce, feel free to jump in. It really, the Almighty has been very involved in this project and he delayed the project. We were going to open, we were going to, we were trying to get this out before the holiday season last year for Hanukkah. And it was delayed. It was nothing we could do. And sometimes the best thing to do is just accept what it is and think, no, it's going to work out for the best. And we did that and it didn't work out because unfortunately, October 7th happened and no one's mind was on buying books or any of this stuff. And when it finally came together, it was actually, I think, released Bruce, am I right, on Amazon February 1st, the first? Right around there, yeah. It, it was right early next year, which was a time when we could at least focus on something else because I think many people were just uh, not able, I, I myself couldn't focus on much else. It worked out pretty well. Now, what was your other question? I didn't hear what your... Really is, did anything change in terms of the function or your vision for the book based on things that have happened in this country or certainly in Israel? I haven't thought about it, but I think it just reinforces the point of writing this book, which is people need guidance right now more than ever because a lot of people just can't seem to figure out what is right and what is wrong. And they can't decipher lies. It is becoming extremely apparent that just going to university and listening to one's heart is not doing it, that they actually need to uh, go back and check out what the Almighty set forth in the desert 3,300 years ago, because he's very clear on what he wanted and what behavior he wants. Now, the, the problem, of course, is believing that there was the Almighty in the desert 3,300 years ago. Actually, there's two questions. One is, is there intelligent design? Because there's lots of arguments that say this is all random. If you put a monkey in front of a typewriter long enough, you're going to get war and peace. Okay, that's a pretty stupid argument. I think most people can realize this is all. There's so much science now that says there's this actual precision of everything in this on this planet. You talk to these scientists. You can read it in our book all the articles. All these people say it's just the odds are just. There's no way that happened. But the second leap, you the second thing you have to do is to say, okay, wait. If they, there was intelligent design. Is that the God that presented himself to this group of slaves that came out of Egypt in 1313 BCE, gave him a document, had Moses wrote it down and was told, you repeat this to your children, they should repeat it to their children for how many generations has it been since 1313, Moses? 133. 133. That's it. That's not that long ago. If you have four generations sitting at a, a Passover table or a Friday night dinner, that's only 30 generations of that. So we're very close to when this was given. Okay, Bruce, how about you from your, your perspective? My perspective didn't really change at all. We really wrote this book, and not just for Jews, but for the whole world. Um, our market is everybody. And what's important is that all the essays are very boiled down. Every essay fits on just one page which is great. When you read it, you read this person's essay. If it doesn't resonate with you, you can turn the page. Someone else is coming at it from a completely different direction. And we just want to bring meaning to people's lives. And I think from the response that we've gotten, it's been successful. 
We've had people that didn't believe in God at all that said, oh, by the time I got to page 43, Dennis Prager's essay, I was sold. I've had people tell me that this book is making them a better person, that I've had a number of people saying to me that the book has really changed their lives. So that's what we want. We just want to get this book out to more and more people. And what's interesting is when you look at our sales, so many people, you know, they buy one copy of the book and then they go back and they buy them for all their kids or all their friends. That's really great. That it's been so well received. Okay. So I have a question for you. It says in the introduction to your book that this book is non-religious, right? It says that several times. Okay. So here's my question. Why leave out these beautiful connections that all these Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Islam, Christianity, essentially have with God? Why? Because I'm assuming some people in their essays actually referenced their religion, maybe not, but why leave that out intentionally? Here's the thing, when in our instructions to people, what we said is this is not a proof of one religion over another. It's not a proof of Judaism, a proof of Christianity, a proof of Islam. So not that someone couldn't mention their religion. In fact, what we said was, ideally, someone should be able to read the essay and not even know what religion you, you follow. But it's quite clear from a number of essays what religion people are, but it's really not supposed to be about proving the religion. It's supposed to just make an argument to prove God, because we all believe in the same God. We want to find common ground between people, bring people together. I got it. Ron? Under one God. Under one God. Under one God. Okay. Did you want to add anything to that, Ron? No. Yeah, I think what's interesting to me is I believe there's some pure essences and some great values that are most of them come from Judaism in all three of these traditions, right? I think the Ten Commandments, basic fundamental values on Jewish life, uh, not on Jewish life, but on life itself, right? The value of life. And so mm -hmm. I think religion, unfortunately, has a really bad rap <laughs> and has for decades, you know. For good reason. For good reason. For, for good reason. Yeah. It's, it's been horrible atrocities you know, committed in extremist versions of religion, for sure there have been. And I'm interested to to somehow temper that in, because a lot of people you'll hear, especially in Northern California, I'm spiritual, but not religious. Or this is a classic, we might edit this out later. I'm Jewish, I'm Jewish. It's not that Jewish, right? I'm like culturally just, Jewish. People are, there's some disconnect between spirituality and religion which is very odd to me because what is religion without spirituality it is a relationship with god spirituality yes so anyway it's something that i'm passionate about trying to move the needle back towards not seeing religion as something that is so terrible and divisive etc because i think at its core it's not it doesn't have to be that's not like the basis of judaism is not hating everyone else right <laughs> the basis of any of these religions is in a nutshell, a relationship with God, right? Yeah, but it, but it's also not watching the Jewish matchmaker and going out to eat bagels on Sunday or Saturday, God forbid. No, no, no. It's I, about, and in fact, I think, and I would argue that religion's been overall terrible, both, and I'm talking about across the spectrum, and I'd be, I'd argue against it. I, not just the the horrible things that were done, the Crusades and all that kind of stuff, but even within, within my own religion, I think this whole generation has been taught, whatever they've been taught is such a turnoff that they only come twice a year. We have 450,000 Jews in the Bay Area. I think how many are some observant in, in San Mateo County, where you probably have 10,000? I think there's uh, two or three or four, maybe, that are that might be. So what, we're doing something wrong? Bruce, any comments on that? I think I agree with Ron that we're going in the wrong direction. And uh, I think most of it all has to do with the messaging. I know that I've gone to synagogues and left very empty. And I've gone to synagogues and left just very inspired. So I think it's all in the delivery and really getting back to the original text. I think that most Jews, they, ha they haven't really read the Torah. Maybe they've been bar bat mitzvahed. But when you really take classes and you start reading, learning this, you really find that the Torah is just an otherworldly document. We went from having hieroglyphics to immediately having the most sophisticated piece of writing ever in the history of man 
hundreds of times more nuanced than Shakespeare. There's no C-spot run book in between. The In Genesis, the first book of the Bible, there's the they gave the dimensions that Noah, a farmer, should build the ark. Why did they have to mention the dimensions? But it was mentioned, and we didn't find out till the 20th century that those dimensions were perfect buoyancy for a vessel. This is 800 years before Homer. There are no seafaring nations. How did we, how come the proportions in the Torah for the Ark are exact dimensions for maximum buoyancy? Also, we were instructed to keep a lunar calendar. How did Jews who were slaves for 210 years determine with really no instruments, how to keep a lunar calendar that today with our satellites and very sophisticated equipment, we find was accurate to the millisecond. I went to synagogue for years. I never learned any of that. But when I started learning it, it just blew my mind. And it makes you want to just learn more and more. Okay, so here's a question. So my last interview was very intense with uh, Hillel Fold. He's an activist in Israel. And he said, he says, look, man, something to this effect, I'll have to get the exact quote. He says to me, half jokingly, half not, he says, what are you doing in California? All the Jews should move to Israel. He's right. And I said, Nahon, it's definitely in my heart. And then I thought for a second, I said, but let's think of one quick logistical question. Where are, we, where are these 8 million people going to fit? And he's like, logistically? Correct. That's totally makes sense. But spiritually, Hashem is going to make it work. So gentlemen, you're here in California. Why are you here in California? How come you're not in Israel? If the Torah is, is telling us we need to all come back home, why are you not there? Oh, I started making Aliyah, but then COVID hit. And then uh, the Nefesh, but Nefesh, that went flat. There were a lot of French Jews leaving. They, they had other priorities. But I, we were, you know, we were going to definitely go there. Okay. No, he's right. Bruce? Callie? Oh, my, or Telly? My, my whole family's here. Uh, my parents, I'm very fortunate to have both my parents alive, my wife's family, my kids. So I'm anchored here at this point, but you never know about the future. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's a tough question. We have it pretty good here, relatively speaking. So anyway, I want us to give focus back on your book, but there's definitely a, a rabbit trail I want to run down a little bit later. I, I want to put script to that. I, I think everyone, one of the things, many things you learn, many, many accidents in Judaism is that we all, have, we all are completely unique, as you all probably know. But you also have a unique mission that only you can do. In your place. Too. Only you. Every person here has a unique mission. Yeah. And you want to look for that mission. You want to carry it out. Sometimes that mission is out of the state of out of Israel. If I was selfish, I would go to Israel because that's where my heart lies and my soul lies. But I, I felt personally that since what, where I was right now, and I think my wife realized this also, is that our mission is right here to let other Jews know that their heritage is majestic. It is so fantastic. And that is our all of our missions as we're dragging along this God, our God, and people who were the example for everyone else. And I think not only are we the example, but we need to tell the other Jews in our area and and for the Christians and for all the other people of Abrahamic uh, religions, what it really was that we were given and what it says. And we should all start to listen to what it says. It's a great point. Shem plants you where you can do the most good, right? What you're supposed to this is called the Holy Sparks podcast, right? What does that mean? We're supposed to be. Well, I was born in Hollywood, which means I'm. <laughs> it's like, it's, but it's true. Wherever you, you find yourself, you're supposed to re reveal the holiness of that area. You're supposed or to bring the sparks down. Yeah. Revealing the Holy Sparks. And so right. every person is a whole universe. And if you affect one person in your local area, wherever you are listening to this podcast, it's a huge thing, right? The Boston Tosa, we reincarnate specifically to do one favor or one mitzvah for one person we don't know oh, did you say that uh, yeah, yeah. We, but we never know which right. one so that's why right. you do as much that's as right. possible right that's right right um, and we don't know the effect that one thing has because like when you throw something in a pond there's many rings it affects a lot of things in fact i think and i'm not the scientist but in quantum mechanics now they know that if you slam your fist on the desk molecules like 14 million light years away are are vibrating like everything affects everything a butterfly effect. Okay, so let's get back to the book real quick. Uh, it's a fascinating conversation. So what author's response surprised you the most? And you can take turns. What author's response? I mean, whether they were going to do it or not, or what they wrote? Not, not what are they going to do, but what they wrote, or their essay specifically, yeah. 
I think I think Itty Kay's was was uh, quite magnificent because she talked about it. She related it to a relationship and being married and uh, how this will change. If you read her essay, and this is Itty right here, she runs a whole educational thing. But basically, she said you should spend your whole lifetime getting to know your mate. That's that's is not that a wonderful thing where you just get to know him better and better. It's like the song, but also that's the same with the Almighty. You can spend all this time learning because he is. He's, we, there's a lot we do know. There's a lot we do know. We have, especially about the afterlife, like Bruce mentioned, reincarnation. Uh, what happens after you die? By the way, we have an expert on near death experiences, Nomi Freeman, who has studied, has met, interviewed hundreds of people with near death experiences. If you are not mystified and freaked out by what she tells you, return your book to Amazon immediately. I will buy it back from you because I, one of the reasons I believe is because what she wrote, because people related, they tell there's some people remember what happened to them. And she's interviewed hundreds, knows about thousands of cases. And when you hear what happens in the afterlife, it all lines up. It's all consistent. There's no, and these people, not them don't, don't even know Bible. They don't know Torah. They don't know anything. They just told her what happened. And it lines up with exactly what some of our uh, Chazal, some of our sages are like uh, the Ram call. Moshe Chaim Luzado and others. So that really is, if nothing more, it'll cause you pause. Okay, Bruce, what about you? Who, what author's response? Well, I liked Rabbi Avraham Stalik, who's considered the Indi the Jewish Indiana Jones. His essay was about proof in art through archaeology that that the there's the Bible's truth in Israel, and that was really interesting. And there were just so many Spiros just going through. All the history, he said that it was his essay is, is saying that if you don't believe in God, look at the fact that the Jews are still here after all we've gone through. That's proof of God. Uh, I love the the chemist, the chemist essay. Dan Levy, yes, talking about amino acids and just the unlikeliness that those could occur. And what I really loved is when people would use these examples. Uh, for example, they would uh, present a number, 10 to the 40th power, uh, and they said, let me explain to you what that number means. And uh, he said, imagine if you were to take a stack of dimes and stack it up to the moon, and then you were to put another stack of dimes right next to it to the moon and another stack next to that, and you filled the entire North American continent with stacks of dime to the moon. And then you took another trillion of North American continent, continents and did the exact same thing. And then if you painted just one dime red and you mixed them all up and you blindfolded someone and had them reach in and pick one dime, the chances that they pick that red dime are the chances that this these amino acids could form like this. I just loved all the examples. Is that the one in 400 trillion chances for you to be born exactly the way you are? Is that what you're referencing there? Or just that life exists as it is? Those are the chances of getting anything, even the most elemental uh, yes. form of life, a basic, maybe single cell or multi-cell uh, organism to work by random, which, which some people, most of the people, that's the argument out there. Right. Wow. That's fascinating. Okay. Bruce, yeah. done? I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just want to clarify. Oh, you did. You know, or other examples about the chances that this could happen would be the chance that there would be a tornado that would go through a junkyard and at the end you'd have a fully functional 747. Uh, I just love all those. I love it. It really makes you think. What is one question that you want to answer, but you have not been asked on a podcast or an interview? Oh. Bruce, start with you. Oh, that's a good question. What question... Have I not been asked? Would you like to do this TV series? <laughs> <laughs> Where do I deposit the Bitcoin? Question. We are doing three volumes of this same collection. I guess just going into that, that we have 70 essays by these thought leaders, but we're still reaching out to other people to get other perspectives that haven't been covered. And our hope is that in the end, that after reading these, that let's say they don't believe one essay or two, it doesn't do it for them. But at the end, they're going to just have to come to the conclusion that there is a God. That's our goal, to make it just no question. Okay. Ron? There were a lot of strange things that happened on this project. I know I've said it in other podcasts, but after a while, I think it was there was no question, at least in Bruce, in my mind, that 
the Almighty had a hand in it, whether it was in our publishing process where I, we had became our own publisher. And I picked a printing company out of all the, I don't know how many printing companies there are in the world because they print in Vietnam, they pr print in Turkey, they print in South Korea and, and all these other countries. And I called a print broker who deals with most of them. He, and uh, I said, who's the best printer in the world? And he's, he gives me this small woman-owned place in uh, Shanghai. I, and I said, that's really funny because that's the one I picked. What are the chances? That was like one in, I don't know, 100,000, 200,000. We had a couple of editors, layout editors, who we gave, we gave the first one a job. And two days later, he was in an accident. Okay, but he couldn't work on his eye was hurt. And then the second one, he has a heart attack two days later. And then we stopped and went, okay, wait a minute. <laughs> what do we do here? And we really focused on getting someone who is probably a lot more spiritual and uh, connected on the third one. Shawnee. And then that seemed to go th through beautifully. And what else? It's just been story after story. We had a deal where originally this book was called Proof of God in 500 Words. So it had to be 500 words. And then we wanted Rabbi Brida, which is one of the great sages of the world, to write in this. But th these great rabbis don't just write for every guys like us. But I was listening to one of his uh, tapes one night and he gave a proof. And, I, and it was like three in the morning or something. And so I sent it to Bruce and Bruce always took it and transcribed it and put it on a Word document. And if you put it on a Word document, it tells you the word count and it came out. Guess how many words? 500. Exactly. And so we sent it to Rabbi Breidowitz and he was like, and then he, he answered immediately. He says, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> I get it. I get this. Even he got that. No one's asked this. A lot of the authors knew there was something going on here. I emailed Dennis Prager at 1.30 a.m. You can tell we were really working hard on this thing. <laughs> And he responded immediately because I'll do it. One is the two guys. Wow. What do you want? One is the two. And we, by the way, we didn't pay any authors anything. We didn't pay them a dime. And we're not making, we're, this is a nonprofit. And all these people who are promoting this book, they're doing it. They don't get a dime. We don't pay any referrals. We don't pay any commissions. We're not even advertising it. I think these are some of the things that have happened that I, your audience should know about that. This is really, what else, Bruce? Well, there's a bunch of these things that just kept happening. And after a while, it, it, I guess we got used to it. <laughs> yeah, Rabbi Kellerman, who wrote our con conclusion of one of our closing arguments of the book, Ron, many years ago, gave me this video of Rabbi Kellerman's called What Exactly Happened at Sinai? And I read, I listened to this video, and it just blew my mind. And I transcribed that uh, video. It actually came out to 17 pages of text. And I sent that to Rabbi Kellerman. And I said, Rabbi, we're doing this book. We saw this video. What exactly happened at Sinai? Is there any way you could boil this down to a 500-word essay for our book? And he said, you know, Bruce, in order for me to do that video, I had to throw out thousands and thousands of words just to, to come up with that argument. So he goes, I just don't see how I could do it. So we got our first no. But over the next course of about 11 months, we had 17 email exchanges back and forth. And all of a sudden, uh, we didn't hear from him for a while. And all of a sudden, I got an email from him that said, Bruce, God is on your side. He said, God gave me double ammonia that had me flat on my back for weeks. And I was able to get all the uh, projects that I haven't been able to get to done. And here's your elevator pitch for God. So that was really quite amazing. Wow, what an amazing story. I <laughs> wanted to say one more thing. As I mentioned, a lot of times people, we got no's when we originally reached out to them. For example, Maya Balak, we, we talked to her agent and we got our first no. Then we, over time, found, located someone else that knew her, and we asked them to actually approach her. We got our second no, and then we went to a relative of hers to approach her. We got our third no, and finally, a Rabbi Shore from Israel said, I, I know her attorney. Let me reach out to him. And the fourth time, we got a yes, and Maim Balak just wrote a great essay for us. Great. Next time you should ask me, I know someone that's friends with her. Anyway, as they say, better call Saul. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm watching that right now, actually. Classic. Okay. So now you did mention a mini series, but it would probably be pretty short considering how short the essays are. What's really your vision for this book moving forward and then the subsequent volumes? What do you see? Where do you see this going? We're doing volume two. Bruce is starting to uh, process the essays on that and reach out. Also, we're producing a podcast series with some of the authors. We're doing. We're going to be doing schmooze sessions coming up with Manus Friedman, with Dr. Gerald Schroeder, 
one of the greatest nuclear physicists, the late Senator Joe Lieberman, may his Navy blessing, would love to have a podcast. And we're just, we're just a little bit delayed on that. We're going to schmooze about the late Senator and what he felt and with his daughters who are very anxious to do that and many others. Uh, Astro, the inventor uh, of the Iron Dome. Ari Sacher, I don't know how to say his name, uh, is coming on. And he's phenomenal. If, if you watch nothing else, look up the video and watch him. If you've never heard him speak, talks about how they get a bullet hitting a bullet in the middle of the air, which is... It's literally he, the clouds of glory protecting. It's a miracle. Even he. It is a miracle. He actually designed it. He said, for everything to go, you guys don't have any idea. It's not even supposed to work. And yet it works every single time, or 90% of the time. That's what I'm working on right now. And that's that's very exciting. Or I'm really looking forward to that. Any thoughts about the upcoming volumes or any? Starting to reach out to people. I'm really excited that Dr. Stephen C. Meyer, who's uh, really a, a world uh, expert in intelligent design, he's already written an essay for us. Also, we have a famous cosmologist from uh, University of San Diego, Brian Keating. Brian Keating is writing for us. And a lot more people are in the works. It's nice now that we have actually a work product that we can show them. That's so interesting. I was just thinking, I wonder what percentage of people globally still at this point don't believe in God. Meaning if you're seeking to convince people of the proof of God, I always like to say when someone tells me they don't believe in God, I say, either I'll, I'll do one of two things. I'll say, tell me more about this God that you don't believe in. And they'll say all kinds of funny things. I'm like, oh, yeah. I, don't, I don't believe in that God either. Yeah, right. So, or I'll just say, and I, I had a professor say this to me one time. I said, I don't believe in God. I said, you know what, sir? The same God that you don't believe in, I also don't believe in. Yeah. And, and this is a professor, yeah. very intelligent, and he just paused for three minutes. He said, I'm going to have to think about that. <laughs> I'll get back. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I think it's the more educated you are, the more foolish you are. And so among our highly educated, there's very little belief in the Almighty. And But among regular people who are working hard, people who just go in and out every day, I think the belief is actually still pretty high. And I think it's pretty pretty ubiquitous among all the nations. But the, like I said, our universities are, what do they say? The beginning of wisdom is a belief in God. And I think in our universities, uh, because they don't believe in God, they become the greatest foolish institutions around, which is pretty obvious what's going on right now with them. And and what they really stand for. So I, I would say, but I say most people believe in God. I think people don't know. And I think this is part of what our mission is, is to say, here's what God wants you to do uh, in improving our own personalities and being a, a, as great a model as we can to other people. And also actually by telling them. And I think people don't know that there's eight Noahide laws if you're not Jewish, and there are 613 if you're Jewish. So you better get work. You better get learning. <laughs> I think it's actually seven Noahide laws, but it, Oh, did I say eight? I'm sorry. There's seven. Maybe there's Wait. a new one. Maybe it's the law of Mashiach. It's eight. <laughs> law of Saul. He added one on in just a case. Well, he, here's the other thing, too, which I find fascinating to me about both Judaism currently and Hashem, or God, which is for them to be meaningful, it takes work. Like any relationship, gentlemen, you're married. You can attest to this. It takes work. You must work at it, Right. <laughs> Maybe this generation, maybe all generations, hard to say, but there's this generation of being entertained, right? Not necessarily Generation X, but whatever that comes after that, you know, YZ, PDQ, Alpha, Beta, Home, School, whatever it is. This generation of just watching videos and their, their greatest form of activism is just taking videos, right? Like this idea of working with wrestling with the Torah. We're supposed to wrestle with it. We're supposed to wrestle with the Siddur. We're, we're Israel. We're the holy wrestlers, right? And so this idea of working at a relationship with God, and I'm not sure how many people spoke about that in the book, but I'm sure someone references this concept. Yes, we're born with this innate connection. Great. Okay. So we're also born with love in our heart. So to have a real relationship, it must take work. You have to cultivate the soil. Would you agree with that, gentlemen? Yeah, I totally agree. You know, they, the, the saying is, you, if you take one step towards God, he'll take one step closer to you. If you take one step away from him, he'll take a step away from you. I would, re I would recommend for people, and I remember I came from zero. I was flat zero, maybe negative on the scale. As I was totally atheist. I said, how do I start? Because, hey, I was going to try stuff and see how it worked out. And they say, talk to God. I know it's uncomfortable, but go have a conversation. Just start saying, hey, you can even say that I'm uncomfortable with this whole conversation, but I'm going to, I read in a book. I said, you should start to talk to God. But if you start to just try and you'll try and, and get some great, there's great podcasts now, then watch what happens in your life. And I say this, not because I am a nut, but the thing is, 
there's things that do happen that you'll it'll give you pause. And I've had a whole bunch of them. I think all of us and so I, you, I don't know about you, but where you go, it was not random. It was put in front of you to say, I'm listening to you. I hear you. I'm watching you. I am you know, clearing your path, turning all the lights green for you because I'm helping you. Do you get that at all? Or Every single day, 100% of the day is all hashkacha prati. Okay. Right. What, what that means to translate, it means divine providence, meaning that everything you hear, everyone, everything you think, everything that comes into your field of awareness is sent to you by Hashem, by God, to show you something, for you to learn, for you to grow. Everything, 100%. And it takes humility to get to the point to say, I'm not God, and there's someone above me, and I don't know it all. A lot of people, they go, oh, you have to do this and that, and the women don't. They come up with all these reasons, but I think it's really, they don't want to work on it. They don't want to do any work. They don't want to be inconvenienced. They do things a certain way. And I would just recommend, I would urge them. I have a business partner and he said, Ron, what do you get out of this whole thing? Because he, he was trying to understand it. And I really didn't have a good answer for him, but I'll, I'll tell you what it is, what I get out of it so far. And it's pleasure. It's pleasure. It's when you have a relationship with the Almighty, there, for me, and I know you guys agree with this, or I like it. There's a pleasure that's equal or greater than anything in the physical world, I think. Yeah. Going back a number of years ago, Ron was the one that kind of lit the spark within me to investigate my Judaism more. And uh, he said to me, he said, just take small steps. And what you're going to find is your life's going to just start getting much better. It really and does. That was my experience. Yeah, so if you turn to God, he's going to turn to you. Bruce, by the way, he he's amazing. He actually, he found out his local Chabad had no Torah, which is the first five books. It's the, to the Christians, it's the Old Testament, the first five books of uh, Moses. So he found it's a mitzvah. It's the 613th mitzvah. Many Jews watching this probably may not know this, is to write your own Torah scroll. And what you can do is instead of writing the whole thing, you can sponsor one, get one put somewhere, pay money to it, work towards it. You don't have to buy the whole thing. So he, what does he do? He, he picks up, starts a whole campaign. And today the Chabad of Danville has an original, handwritten, beautiful Torah scroll because of Bruce. And, and by the way, Bruce, there, there's a mitzvah for you right there. How many people's lives have you changed because of that? And also to one more thing to add to that mitzvah, there's a, you don't have to write an entire Torah. You can sponsor a letter or write a letter. And that also Just one letter. Hey, you can make a small donation for a letter. It can be $5, but then you've satisfied the mitzvah. Most of these mitzvahs, don't, they don't cost much. Some do. <laughs> I called a number of synagogues all around the Bay Area, and I said, do you have a Torah in the works or a campaign? And a lot of these synagogues, they had four or five Torahs in their ark. And then Ron said to me, why don't you call Shmuley Raymond out in Danville? And so I did. And I said, Rabbi, isn't the 613th commandment to, to write a Torah? And he said, it is. And I said, do you have a Torah? And he said, no. I said, you need your own Torah. And we did start the campaign. And about a year and a half later, we had a, a brand new Torah for, written in Israel. It was fantastic. And, and just when the news traveled, to, you know, he's on the East Bay. It came over here and I sent a few guys money poured in. It was, and it was like, we were all so happy to be able to buy a letter, a word, whatever it was. We all just poured money into it. It, it got funded right away. And I, they're pretty expensive. We're like $50,000, $70,000, a lot of money. And it was just, everyone was like, oh, this is great. We're all dancing meta, <laughs> metaphorically, I guess you say, because we're so happy to buy a, a, a Chabad, a, a Torah. As Ron mentioned, we did form a nonprofit. It's called For Good and For All, where the book is housed in. And you can go to our website, elevatorpitchesforgod.com or ep, the number four, g.com, and you can learn all about the book. You can see all the authors that have written. You can see samples of the essays. And the book is available in a hardcover, a Kindle version, and an audio book. Perfect. And there will be links below wherever you're hearing this podcast to check it out. Okay, we're going to wrap up here because I know you, you gentlemen have to go as well. But I want to ask you both one question that I ask every guest that's on the Holy Spirit podcast, which is simply this. What does the Jewish world need now most and why? Bruce, I'll start with you. Wow. They say, the Torah says that you need to know God before you love God. So I think uh, that would be it, that more people just need to uh, 
dip their feet, you know, into the water and just start to investigate. And as they know God more and more, they're going to love God. Beautiful. Ron? I would have had, before October 7th, I would have said unity. Now I would say, uh, Bruce has said learning, and I think that's good. And I think uh, Shabbos. I think if every Jew would start to just light candles on Friday night, have a Shabbos dinner, turn your phone off for an hour if you can, two hours, move it up, invite friends over, put all the politics aside, get this book, re have people love reading an essay and then talking about it. Ha have one of the, when something strikes you, then just read to everybody and, let, and discuss it. Just, th this is where you'll get real meaning in life. N none of this other stuff that you're watching, none of this physical stuff makes any difference at all. I would say that. How about that? Shabbos. Shabbos. Gentlemen, thank you so much. I want to end with a blessing that Hashem should bless you both, that your book, Elevator Pitches for God, should inspire thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of people to reconnect to their source, to reconnect to Hashem, to God, and that it should open doorways, uh, unbelievable doorways that were invisible and you didn't even know that they were invisible and you didn't even know what was possible on the other side. It should build bridges, it should build connections, and that you should be so satisfied knowing that you are opening a doorway to many people for whom the doorway to Hashem and religion may be closed and that this could be a pathway to greater tikkun olam in the world. And I want to thank you so much for spending your precious time with us on the Holy Sparks podcast, and we'll see you on the next episode. Thank you, Saul. Thank you for having us.